Um, and, you know, once again, to, to Amy and Janet, um, because I feel like I'm, you know, just talking to myself in my office, um, feel free to interrupt if, if anything, if, you know, there's a problem with the, um, the slides or anything, uh, just let me know. So uh, once again, I'm Sarah Boyce. I'm the Director of Research and Education at the Linda Loring Nature Foundation. And I'm gonna be talking about some research we have going on in progress. So there's gonna be, these are preliminary results, um, but also hopefully to encourage people um, to think maybe differently about Scotch Broom and to um, maybe uh, join us in some volunteer efforts. So before I go too far, I do wanna thank um, a funding agency. So the New England Botanical Club, I was fortunate to get a small grant from them. Uh, it's uh, the Les Meerhoff Botanical Research Award. Um, so not only is it helpful, obviously, for research, um, but also I knew Les Meerhoff. He was one of my mentors botanically when I was in graduate school. So it's an honor to me to um, get his uh, award or the Botanical Research Award um, in his name. And so um, Les did teach me everything or almost everything I know about invasive species. And so with that, we're going to get started. So I'm going to be talking a lot about tonight about invasive plants um, and non-native plants. So I thought I'd uh, start with our definition. So, and by definition, I mean, um, this is the definition that we use as the Nantucket um, Invasive Plant Species Committee, which I'm the co-chair of. Um, and this language is similar language to what's used at the state level to define invasives, although it gets much more in depth. So a non-native is a species that's unlikely to have arrived at a place without human assistance. So um, not species that naturally seeds come new to an area from uh, nearby. It's a species that came um, with human assistance. And then um, invasive plants are plants that have established that are established non-native species that spread with negative impacts. And by negative impacts, there's three main categories. There's economic impacts, impacts to human health, and ecological impacts. And just to go over those really quickly um, about what those harm, uh, examples of those um, harm might be. Um, for economic, we talk about um, how much maybe the state uh, spends in invasive plant control, um, the U.S. currently estimated costs are about $20 billion a year. Um, it can be impacts to specific industries, for example. Um, human health might be individual species that are toxic, but oftentimes it's things like this example where we know that um, we know from research that uh, invasive shrub populations are host to higher tick densities. And obviously ticks are um, cause human health harm. So we're um, another reason to not like invasive plant species. Um, and a primary concern for me as a um, working at a land trust and managing a property, I'm interested in the ecological impacts where invasive species can crowd out natives, be harmful to native insects, birds, wildlife, and, um, and rare species. So that's why you shouldn't like invasive species. <laughs> and so, um, in, in the interest of kind of combating or fighting invasive species, we think about when is the best time to manage them and when is the best time um, in the cycle of an invasive species um, to decide that they're invasive and kind of work on them. And what I mean by that is we have this figure that we call it the invasion curve. So when things are kind of early on the invasion curve, there's like one, one or two plants that are new to an area, they're in very low abundance. Um, at that time, the cost for removal of those is very low. Um, and if you stay on that blue line, then you're not going to be an invasive plant because you're low, low population, low abundance. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, it's when the plant gets across some threshold, which is that dotted line, and starts to follow that red track where there's rapid population growth and exponential growth. And by the time the plants get to this kind of expanded growth, that's when people really notice that the plant is a problem. It's causing some kind of harm. Um, and this is when people want to, like the general public, want to um, eradicate a species. Think about Japanese knotweed, for example, that overtakes an area. But at this point, when it's at this point of that curve, the cost and the time that would take to manage and eradicate a species it's nearly impossible to do. So what I'm really interested in is these early 
the early on the blue line. So these sleeper species, and they're called sleeper species because there's there's no um, uh, definitive amount of time that a plant can stay in that early phase. It could be a year, five years, a hundred years before their sudden rapid growth. So if we can manage those early species, those sleeper species, we're going to be ahead of the game. And so how do we know what's what are those sleeper species? Um, and one of the and also what are those um, uh, you know that threshold that's going to encourage the plant to grow um, exponentially. And right now we're looking a lot at climate. And I'll get into this more a little bit later. But that's where we're coming from. How do we get those sleeper species? So one thing we can do is we can learn from other areas, other states, other regions, um, areas with similar habitat types. And so um, this picture is of a coastal grassland in a dune community, but it's not anywhere near here. This is the coast of Oregon. Um, so shifting sands, uh, coastal shrublands, and coastal um, grasslands, which are affectionately known as coastal prairies there. And they have a lot of similar um, habit, um, not just habitat types, but similar species compositions, um, maybe not exact species, but in some cases they have exact species that we do, but there's a lot of similar and uh, comparable species compositions. And um, when I lived in Oregon, which is right before I moved back to Nantucket in 2014, um, when we were going along the Oregon coast, we were seeing a lot of these types of communities in the, um, in the late spring. So these dune communities, dune grasses, coastal shrublands, and then a lot of this yellow color. And um, being in Oregon, you kind of, and during flowering time, you quickly see a lot, a lot of this one species, which is scotch broom. So scotch broom or Cytisus scoparius is the, um, the Latin name. And during blooming time for scotch broom on the West Coast, it is very prevalent. Um, any open, have open sunny habitat or virtually almost any open sunny habitat will have um, populations of scotch broom. You're gonna see a lot of pictures of them in yellow. They're obviously only blooming a very short time of year, but it's very easy to see at a landscape level when I show it in bright yellow. <laughs> so because we're gonna be talking about scotch broom with that, we just go over a little bit of biology um, and some botanical information. Um, it's a woody shrub of the pea family. And so it has these um, pea-like flowers, these yellow flowers. Um, and they're bright yellow. Here in Nantucket, they bloom like end of May, early June. Um, and some of them in the horticultural trade, um, they have these reddish centers, sometimes orange. They can be quite pale yellow. They can be bright yellow. Um, there are a few other species of broom. French broom and Portuguese broom are um, very closely related and have different colors of flowers. Um, we don't really have uh, we're, we're really focusing on scotch broom here, especially for Nantucket. Um, and they're semi deciduous, which I think is really interesting because um, if you look at the picture on the left, there's the, the flowers, but you also see a lot of the little um, uh, the, le the leaves. And in the fall, these leaves all fall off. But when they're being semi deciduous, um, the leaves fall off, but the stems remain um, bright green. And so you can see from this ridge stem picture, which is a close up, um, the, the main stem actually stays green and photosynthetic throughout the winter. So it's constantly photosynthesizing. The older parts of the shrub um, might be woodier and lose some of that green bit, but a lot of the plant is still photosynthetic in the winter time. Um, reproduction. So this, some of this is from the Oregon Invasive Species Council, um, where they've done a lot of research into um, reproduction and and seed output um, of the species. So they reproduce um, at a relatively young age, um, about two to three years old, which is about two to three feet tall. We have kind of shorter scotch broom as a lot of our um, species are stunted. Um, they have ballistic seed dispersal, which I will um, show a little bit later, but basically um, it shoots out seeds. So if you look at the picture in the upper right, there's a seed pod that's busted open, so it's all curly. And when the, um, as the seed pod matures, it dries out and there's um, under a lot of pressure. And once the pressure is released, the uh, pod itself just busts open and it can shoot the seeds up to 10 feet from the adult plant. So that's great if you're trying to you know, disperse your seeds further. And then from there, seeds can be just dispersed by animals or wind or water or anything. 
Uh, seeds have been so shown to persist in the soil for at least five years, but as much as 20 plus or uh, 30 plus years. And the seed banks, so the seeds that remain in the soil, can be um, more than 2,000 seeds per square foot. So if you have an adult plant that's producing seeds, thousands of seeds every single year, um, those can remain in, this, in the soil at great densities. And so here's a picture of a little seedling too. So in thinking about where, um, you know, this is a map from EdMaps, which is the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping Service. So for um, the United States, this is the main invasive species database. And so um, it's great to look at individual species that we have here and where else they occur. Um, and so looking at it by county, we can see heavily inv in invasive um, in the Western states, in Southern New England, along the coast and parts of the Mid-Atlantic it's found as well. When we kind of drill down into Oregon and get an idea of the invasive potential of where it already is invasive, you can see these, um, the, red, um, the red bits are um, occurrence point information. They're kind of aggregated because of the type of map, but you can see they're in the tens of thousands. So outside of Eugene, there's more than 7,000 um, uh, records uh, for Scotch broom. There's like almost 3,000 up here, 4,000. Um, but what does that look like on the ground? Well, along the coast, this is an area, Catslap Plains, where I did a lot of um, conservation work when I was out there. That's um, right along the coast. Um, there's coastal, those are the coastal grasslands. And then a little further inland, we have, this is, a, sorry, it's a blurry picture. This is a Fern Ridge, which is a national wildlife refuge outside of Eugene. It's right in this area. So we have the coastal grasslands, um, and then farther inland, we have the Willamette Valley. So a lot of these in, within Willamette Valley have dry and wet prairies, um, a lot of similar species compositions, very reminiscent of, um, you know, Midwestern prairies as well as the grasslands that we have, and they're all being invaded by scotch broom. And it's not just the grasslands, um, there's, like with many invasive species, we see them on the highway edges, um, you know, bike paths and uh, power line right of ways, the rocky coast, the sandy um, sandy soils of the coastal grasslands. Um, this isn't yellow, this is, uh, you know, non-blooming scotch broom, but um, federal lands of which there are many in the West, um, lots of open spaces, and just this kind of sea of a monoculture is what, um, you know, we are seeing pretty regularly. Another thing to think about is the economic cost. So, um, Oregon and, and Washington State are um, big for timber harvest, as many people know. And while Scotch Green doesn't like to be shaded out, it quickly invades after clear cutting. So um, a lot of areas are logged, um, and then they plant. Then there's you know room for additional growth of um, secondary growth of the forest. Um, but the regular rotation of um, thinning forests and logging is interrupted because any open um, area gets quickly invaded by scotch broom and a few other invasives like gorse is another big one that's very similar to um, scotch broom. And it's estimated that within the state of Oregon alone, they spend $40 million annually in removal and management, not of invasive species, just scotch broom. So um, this is one that you know plagues many industries there. And there's um, you know, lots of different statewide, region-wide management efforts. The Oregon Invasive Species Council does a lot of like group events, cutting, pulling. Um, there's um, it's recommended herbicides. So there's just a lot of removal and remediation um, going on, and it's uh, quite labor intensive and very expensive. Um, in addition to forming these you know dense monospecific stands of solid Scotch broom, the other things that make it you know, give it a negative impact is that it's highly competitive in nutrient poor soils. So that's important to remember because we also have nutrient poor soils. And the fact that it is, um, it can fix its own nitrogen makes it highly competitive in these areas. Um, its seeds are toxic as well as the mature shoots unpalatable to grazers. So um, in the West, they have elk and mule deer and white-tailed deer. Um, here, are, it would be our white-tailed deer, and while, um, you know, so the, the animals will 
avoid it and then preferentially eat the native habit, um, native plants. So it's further um, having a secondary negative effect on our native plants. And then kind of one of the big ones, especially out in the West is that it increases wildland fire risk. So it's, um, it burns really easily and it spreads, <clears throat> excuse me, it carries fire into canopy forests. So while we're less worried about the canopy forest part, um, we don't really need any additional um, potential fire hazards on our landscape. Um, and you can understand why that would be a significant problem out in the West. So all of these things are in my mind um, as I leave Oregon and I move out, back out to Nantucket. So in 2014, when I came back to Nantucket to work at the Linda Lauren Nature Foundation, I started seeing scotch broom around and you know, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so worried about it because of everything we had seen on the West Coast. So it becomes a perfect species to kind of learn from our neighbors. I mean, not our near neighbors, but learn from our similar habitat types and um, what the potential is here. So looking at EDMAPS back in the day. So EDMAPS, once again, is that distribution database. Um, when I first pulled up EDMAPS looking in 2014 for where um, we had any documentation of Scotch broom across the island, there were only four points. And so when we kind of look at what they are, we had one from 1904, we had um, some from 1900 up to probably 1966. We had a few from 2004. So for a digital database, it might be interesting why we have these um, records from 1900. And that's because Les Mierhoff, who I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, in a previous, um, a previous project, he had digitized um, the location information for all the invasive species in New England. So from herbarium records, um, from the Harvard herbarium, from the herbarium in um, Vermont, Maine, many of the universities, small herbaria as well. Um, and so we have all of the records of Scotch broom from for Nantucket from the early 1900s. So that's really helpful information. Some of them don't have great exact location information, but we have about, um, ooh, I forget the number off the top of my head, but I think there's um, probably less than 10 individuals that are from um, uh, before 1950. So, <clears throat> so, sorry. So we can think about, okay, so a species that's been here for well over a hundred years, um, why are we worried about it now? You know, a um, hundred years ago, when it was planted, it's um, persisted in the sense of we still have scotch broom here, but it hasn't taken off to like the extent of some of those photos that I showed earlier um, from um, the West Coast. Well, I'm gonna go back to that sleeper species idea. So one of the things we talked about with sleeper species is that there's some threshold that they cross where they might be fine for a long time and they suddenly become more and more invasive. So the diagram or the, the image on the right shows um, it basically an infographic of how our changing climate will feel. So right now, um, we're already warmer than we were in our kind of pre, what we consider normal um, temperatures for Massachusetts. We're currently closer to Long Island. <laughs> um, and all projections are showing that we're gonna be getting warmer and warmer and the degree of warmness and, um, and severity of the, the change is still to be determined, but we know we're, that our climate is getting warmer. Um, and that means for us, uh, we're already in a kind of maritime milder climate for Nantucket, but we're gonna be having milder and milder winters. Um, one of the things that people believe that Scotch broom has kind of been in check is that um, it freeze, you know, the freezing winters that we ha sometimes have kind of keep it at bay. So that's the argument that I've heard. Um, and so, but as a sleeper species, kind of bringing back this diagram, if climate is this is what is gonna make this species more suitable to awaken, I don't really like the term awaken, but basically kind of take, start to take that red rapid population growth track. Um, should we be really managing the species now? So are we right here? If, you know, that little green uh, pretend plant we're kind of at this crossroads right now and are we gonna you know is the plant gonna start to continue this rapid growth um and can we nip it in the bud literally and figuratively sorry i'm gonna imagine in my head you're all laughing at that joke um <laughs> so are we gonna 
you know, take care of that now before the cost of control is so much more. So um, a lot of people that study invasive species are really looking at climate change is actually offering an opportunity for us to be proactive about invasive species. Usually invasive species management is very reactive. So as a species gets so overwhelming and out of control, we have to do something about it. If we can be proactive because we know this species has the potential with um, warmer, um, warmer winters that we can um, be pre sorry, preventative and proactive about invasive species management. So I was like, let's try to get it listed as invasive. So Massachusetts, in, the Massachusetts Invasive Plant Advisory Group, or MIPAG, is our state advisory group that officially lists plants as invasive, likely invasive, potentially invasive. Um, and it's kind of the first step in a lot of this proactive management or management of a species. Because to be officially listed will um, not only stop the horticultural sale of a plant, it prevents the plant from being transported cross boundaries. Um, and then it also encourages people generally to no longer plant the species and hopefully eradicate it. So that's kind of the first step. Um, I did find that actually this species has come up for review several times with MIPAG and it's currently states that um, there, the current evidence does not show that it is, it is spreading rapidly from cultivation or that it's outcompeting native species in Massachusetts. Um, so this is a picture of scotch broom in the dunes and this is actually from Provincetown. So this is the Provincetown sand dunes. Um, I don't know when this picture was taken, so I'm not sure if it's ever been managed or not, but um, I feel like this is reminiscent to me of some of the highly invaded areas um, on the West Coast. So, you know, it's, um, I am cautious about this. So what are the criteria then that they're using to evaluate? So um, first it has to be non-indigenous to Massachusetts. So we know that it's not native. Um, it's native, I forgot to mention this, it's native to uh, Western and Central Europe. So um, it has to have the potential for rapid and widespread dispersal and establishment in minimally managed habitats. So we know that they actually, um, the advisory group really emphasizes minimally managed habitats. So basically not just a garden, it has to escape cultivation and move outside into these you know, kind of open spaces. It has to have the potential for dispersing away from the site of introduction, so getting itself out. So it has to be able to spread by seed or rhizomes or however the seed, um, the plant spreads. And it has to have the potential to exist in high numbers away from the intensively managed artificial habitats. So that's kind of another way of saying it has to um, escape cultivation. So wherever it was planted, it has to kind of escape away. So I was like, I can do this. You know, I'm motivated, I'm concerned because of where I had seen it before. And so I feel like um, this is an opportunity to, um, you know, put um, some study into action and try to do, do some of this documentation. We know it's here. And so let's start monitoring it. So we started our Scotch Broom project. It was sort of unofficial that for a while um, I talked about it with people and I would record locations. And um, I know that the different conservation organizations have monitored it in the past on their properties, but we really wanted to um, look island wide. And so our first goal was to map all the locations of Scotch Broom that we could throughout the island. And so the survey area was the, is the entire island. Um, but we're really focusing on public accessible um, areas. So like bikes, or sorry, bike paths, roads, open spaces, trails, um, and basically as much as we can up the island, but avoiding like personal property and homes. And we really wanna target and specifically emphasize um, open space and minimally managed habitats. And then we wanna document the presence of reproductive reproduction so um, and seed dispersal. So that'll be um, seed production, seed dispersal, um, any seedlings present that we find. So those are kind of the, the different types of documentation that we're looking for. <clears throat> Excuse me a sec. <clears throat> so how we do this is um, it's really all about mapping. And I've 
mentioned EDMAPS a few times, EDMAPS being the Invasive Species Distributional Database. And they have a number of different apps. Um, and for our New England area, um, the Outsmart Invasive app is the one that we use. Um, it is um, free and easy to use. It does take quite a bit of memory on your phone, so to think about that if you're interested in, in downloading it. Um, and the our state, the MIPAG, the State um, Advisory Group on Invasive Plants, um, uses the records in EDMAPS. So that's what they're looking at for um, documentation. So we use EDMAPS to document species. And at the very least, like the most minimal information we need is you go to a scotch root plant, you record the location and you take a photo for documentation. And you can take a photo in the app or you can take a photo and then upload it later to the app. Um, but basically <clears throat> we just need documentation that um, Scotch Broom, that you know what you're talking about with Scotch Broom. Um, there are independent verifiers um, for the island. And so anytime anyone takes a, um, a makes a EDMAPS record for an invasive species, uh, verifiers get an email and they can um, specifically verify that that uh, plant is the one you say it is. So these are verified records. In addition, um, I'm collecting information on the evidence of reproduction, as I mentioned before, and then noting any other potentially impacted species. So, and this is just done in the notes section. So this on the right is a picture of what the phone um, interface looks like when you're taking um, a record. And so, um, aside from noting reproduction, if there's any rare species nearby or any con other concerns um, that can be added to the notes, or if the species is man, if that individual plant is managed at some point too. So what I'm going to be showing next is kind of what we know so far. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this is a preliminary data set. So we're still doing more work and collecting more data. And I'm encouraging people to kind of help in the effort if, if there's interest. So um, right now, so this is obviously the island, um, but for all these yellow dots are actual survey points. Um, and there are 100 survey points. And um, each survey point doesn't represent one plant. So uh, that's the other bit of information that's often recorded is how many, it's like the density as well as how many individuals are within your survey area. And so there's many more than over 300 individual plants um, because some of these records just came in very recently and I haven't sort of <laughs> started through all the notes. Um, I think there's closer to about 500 plants. Some areas are more dense than others. And when we finalize all this data, probably within the next, hopefully six months or so, um, we'll be able to show kind of where the more dense populations are as well. Uh, and right now, I feel like we've surveyed about half the island. So the surveys have been both um, purposeful and incidental. And by incidental, I mean, um, you know, any of us, especially in the last eight months, have been outside quite a bit, exploring new properties. We walk our dog, we walk with my family. So sometimes we're just having a regular family walk and I'm kind of keeping an eye out and I might see um, a scotch broom or I don't see anything and I can kind of cross that area off the survey list. But a lot of times we're um, really targeting uh, entire roadways, entire bike paths, certain properties and that kind of thing. So in that light, this is a very rough estimation, this kind of blue um, graded area of areas that further need to be surveyed. Um, I don't, it's not that I think that there's scotch room in all of these areas, but I don't have um, a definitive, like these areas were searched for scotch broom. So these are the areas that we're working on now, and we do have a few volunteers, as well as myself, um, going through some of these areas. <laughs> so one of the things I talked about was the importance of minimally managed habitats. So what we did was um, you want to look at where all these points are occurring, so where all these survey points are occurring, um, what kind of habitats are the scotch broom, or sorry, what kind of properties are the scotch broom uh, plants abutting? And for a previous project about a year ago, I created this map that was independent of ownership. Uh, what were the conserved areas, moderately conserved and non-conserved open space. So basically anything that's green, uh, blue or pink are some kind of open space. Um, so undeveloped landscape. 
And when we overlay that with our, our um, scotch broom points, we we're able to look at what habitats they occurred on. And overwhelmingly, um, about 74% were on what I would call either conserved or minimally managed open space. So um, in some cases it is conservation land, in some cases it's um, just open areas that are maybe privately owned but are open space. Um, but basically what that means is that there's, um, you know, scotch broom in these areas that are in this minimally managed habitat. So not in a landscaped area, not in a garden and not in, you know, like a homestead, but in these kind of more naturalized landscapes. We can further look at habitat type. So um, the Nature Conservancy map that's in the upper um, right corner um, highlights 37 different habitat types for Nantucket. Um, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but the pie chart shows where the percentages of where our scotch broom plants currently occur. So as expected, um, primarily they're in coastal shrub shrublands. Um, as a coastal shrub itself, it makes sense that they're in those habitats um, and they are part of that, that mix. Um, but it is concerning since it could be displacing other native um, coastal shrubs. Um, it occur it's occurring quite a bit in pitch pine habitat. Um, so I'd be interested to kind of look into that a little bit more. I suspect that's um, some of the uh, bike path areas. And then my main concern personally is thinking about these grasslands. So there's quite a bit um, of them adjacent to or within grasslands on Nantucket. And as we know, um, you know, for con conservation on Nantucket, sampling grasslands is one of our highest valued habitats on the island. Sampling grasslands are globally rare habitat and host to a number of rare species. So I'm always concerned or um, thinking about uh, the impact of these habitats when we have potentially invasive species, even if they're beautiful. <laughs> so let's, I just wanted to have some uh, visuals for you of what that looks like on the ground. So you can see maps and you can see figures, but what does that look like on the ground? So here's an example of a minimally managed habitat. So this is one of our, you know, walking areas, um, open space, and this actually is a really dense population. I think there's probably about 50 um, really adult, mature, really mature adult plants here, but it's part of this mix. So there's there's other shrubs in here. There's forbs and grasses on the edge. There's um, small trees, but it's really becoming a dominant part of this landscape, and it's right near this this little open packet. Um, so this is from early fall. So I just had a close up of these evergreen um, stems. There's, you know, the, the leaves have already fallen off for the fall, the small leaves. And so there's this photosynthetic stems. And then many of the, or a majority of the adult plants had seed pods. Um, half of these had opened. So you can see some of them had like are opened and unfurled and some of them are still full. So they're um, actively dehissing or exploding their seeds out. And I'm primarily concerned because in this area, not like 100 yards from this major scotch broom population, is a um, you know managed sampling grassland with rare species, including this New England blazing star. And so um, this is what we think about as land managers when we think of the invasive species, the sleeper species that probably were, have been there for quite a long time um, and now have the potential to expand into some of these other open areas. Another minimally managed habitat as an example, um, this is a long Madiket bike path. And so I'm probably standing on the bike path or maybe in, in a little bit from the bike path. There's this huge scotch broom that's on the right side that's kind of in the foreground. Um, this is pretty recent, like, I think this is last month. So um, there's no leaves on it, but some of it's dead, some of it's alive. But if you look farther in, there's a little scotch broom there, there's a little scotch broom there and there's one there, and there's kind of a little one in here. So um, if we're out in the field and I could show you it, <laughs> it's really easy to identify. Um, it's very distinct looking from other shrubs of its size, but it is expanding away from the edge of the bike path where um, we see a lot of it and into the natural landscape, um, uh, you know, further out. So let's go back to the MyPag um, criteria for invasive species. So we can already check off that it's not 
um, native to Massachusetts. We know it's from Europe. That's a kind of given. Um, does it have the potential for rapid and widespread dispersal and establishment in minimally managed habitat? So if we think about that slide I just showed you and some of the others, you know, what we have so far, the data we have so far, which is not the complete data set, but what we have so far is showing that it can invade into these minimally managed habitats. Okay, now looking at evidence of reproduction. So showing it flowering, you know, it's a flowering plant. Um, it's gorgeous, that's why people plant it. Um, but in addition to the flowering st uh, stage, we have lots and lots of seed pods. So um, individual uh, mature plants can produce about, um, oh, I forgot my stat. It was like 9,000 seeds a year. Um, and a majority, I think almost every single mature plant had seed pods if we were viewing them during um, seed output time, you know, during flowering, obviously you can't tell, but almost every single one had seed pods. Um, and a lot of the seed pods, you know, this is um, along a dirt road that's um, leading into the middle moors. And um, there were, this whole roadway was lined with this and all the seeds would shoot out. And, you know, anyone riding a bike or walking a dog or anything could easily transport seeds further in. So um, this is a really short little video. It's only about, you know, six seconds long, but I want you to listen to it. So when I hit play, I'm going to be quiet for a sec, I promise. Um, but these are seed pods that are actively opening. Um, and I took this video this fall. So it's kind of quiet. So when I stop talking, you can turn your volume up for a sec. So that little popping sound. So, so that is the ballistic seed dis dispersal in action. I was trying to get a video of one that was actively exploding and I couldn't quite get it, but um, this whole bank of scotch fruit room um, was in the, um, you know, the beautiful sunshine. It was like late August sunshine and they were just exploding. It sounded like popcorn, the whole, the whole place did and they're shooting seeds everywhere. So, um, you know, and this is happening basically at every mature stand that we're, that we're finding. So I feel like we, we just, we definitely have the potential for dispersing over kind of a wide area. So not only are there tons and tons of reproductive output, but they're spreading the seed quite vigorously and far from the, um, the point of um, from where the adults are. Now, the last point is something that we're looking into is the potential um, for existing in high numbers away from intensively managed artificial habitat. So is it actually spreading? Um, we have evidence of bits of it, but um, I wanna show you one other piece of evidence. So um, Kelly Oman from the Nantucket Conservation Foundation um, shared this with me very recently and she was, um, Happy to let me uh, share it with you tonight. So um, at Tuppence Links, which is um, the Conservation Foundation's property on Cliff Road, Tuppence Links used to be a golf course, for those of you who didn't know, many years ago. Um, it's one of the first Conservation Foundation properties, I believe. And so there was scotch broom there that was likely planted at the time um, that it was a golf course. And um, it's something that has been both managed and monitored at different points by the Conservation Foundation. Um, and in 2015, um, the Conservation Foundation, the, the Science and Stewardship Department um, monitored and um, GPS the population um, all around Tuppence, but I'm going to show this one area. So the bright yellow polygons are the extent of the population in 2015. So you can see, you know, these, uh, those were like the dense areas. Um, of scotch broom, and then the dots were kind of individual plants. And then Kelly was telling me that she'd no they had noticed that it was expanding and kind of getting bigger into this year in 2020, just in no earlier in November, so just a few weeks ago, um, they went back out to um, document the dense cover now. So just five years later. And so this turquoise outline is now the dense population of scotch broom. 
And by looking at the different area, the areas between the two, it's more than 4,000 foot squ square foot increase in coverage. And just because that's a little, might be a little hard to see, I kind of zoomed in a bit. Um, and so what we're looking at is just in this one area in, in five years, um, you know, these plants expanded um, and it's in a very open area. They expanded significantly and they've probably been there for at least 50 years, if not longer. Um, and Kelly can correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, and that's pure conjecture. But, um, you know, thinking about that sleeper species idea of these plants have been here a really long time, but just in the last five years is when they're seeing a lot more expansion. And there's other complicating factors as well. The areas mowed um, periodically. Um, and I know, you know, just to report out that they are managing this population. So while I think there is the potential um, for this, um, you know, escaping, you know, if we get that, we could check off number four. I think that's where we still need to do a lot more investigation um, because that in high numbers, um, we have, you know, we have lots of specific examples of um, small populations that are expanding into minimally managed habitats. But um, I don't know if we have the numbers that my PAG might be looking for, but I definitely think it's something that we as an island should be really thinking about and concerned about in terms of further plantings um, or managing what we do already have. And a lot of it is about, you know, continuing to survey additional areas and then to do further studies um, on the populations that we do find. So what's next? So um, as we're kind of, as I mentioned, um, we want to complete their, our mapping. So I do, you know, Scotch Room being um, evergreen, partly evergreen is a really great one to work with in winter. Um, and with COVID, we're going to be outside you know, it's gonna be the only thing we have to do is to go outside all the time this winter. So um, I'm gonna be, you know, doing more surveys for Scotch Broom um, to look at reproposing to my PAG that they consider Scotch Broom for, um, to be considered invasive. And then additionally, I'd like to do some seed germination trials. So we know that there's, you know, extensive seed output for each plant, but for Nantucket plants, how many of those seeds are viable? what's the percentage of um, viable seeds and so that we can get an idea of the real reproductive potential. And then also maybe doing some seed bank studies, um, looking at um, what is in the, in the seed bank for some of those older stands of Scotch broom and are those seeds viable? So if you're interested, um, at the very least, I hope you manage your castle. So if you already have Scotch broom on your property because it's beautiful and you love it, just keep it in check. Um, maybe clip seed pods off after the flowering is done um, and just you know manage your landscape. Um, no proper disposal. So um, our Nantucket dump does have an invasive species dumpster. If you tell the um, people at the dump that you have invasive species, they will point you to the dumpster um, rather than the compost. <laughs> um, responsible landscaping practices, plant native species when possible. And then uh, report invasive plants. So you can either use the app, which I, you know, it's um, a great way to be active in the winter, especially. And I'd be happy to train anyone um, socially distanced and masked up, of course. Um, or if you have populations of Scotch Room that you're concerned about that you find any, any, on any of your walks, um, you can take a picture and send it to me um, and I will happily um, go investigate it for myself. And with that, I want to thank everyone for listening to me. Um, I hope that you are made mildly convinced or at least will think twice about Scotch broom and other potentially um, invasive species um, on the island. And I wanna thank again to the Nantucket Athenaeum for inviting me here tonight. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, so Anne asks, um, actually, let me give you a minute to grab a sip of water. <laughs> um, I realized my heat came on and I was like yelling over the sound of my fan. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I start yelling. Uh, no. Um, so Anne asks, was uh, Scott's broom brought to Nantucket intentionally? And if so, for what purpose? Um, thank you for that question. I meant to mention that when I first um, introduced Scotch Broom. So 
Um, Scotch Green was brought to the United States because for horticultural reasons, because it is beautiful. Um, it was brought to Nantucket like many things that were brought to Nantucket early, both for its beauty and for its soil stabilization. So um, it grows quickly, like a lot of invasive species do. So if you plant it somewhere, it can, you know, kind of establish quickly. It, it does have deep roots, but nothing, you know, as extensive as like Japanese knotweed for anyone who's tried to battle Japanese knotweed. But um, that's one of the reasons why it's causing such problems um, on the Oregon coast, because of the, um, it does stabilize the sand in some areas and the Oregon dunes are actually shifting dunes. Like they need to be movable. So um, yeah, so that's one of the, the, one of the reasons. So I think, yeah, it's like the horticultural trade, like a lot of things, it's really beautiful. Um, and it, you know, Amy and I were talking earlier, it does flower at an earlier time. So it's kind of at a time when it's really welcome to have that beautiful yellow color. So plant for Scythia and stuff. <laughs> oh, so for Scythia isn't considered invasive? Yeah, so it doesn't, Forsythia isn't considered an escape, an escapee. We don't see it at, you know, it does, um, if it's not maintained, it kind of has that wild look about it, but it doesn't quite uh, get into the minimally managed areas that we think of. I could, I'm happy to be proven wrong though. <laughs> <clears throat> so we have a question from Mary um, who says, every time I've looked at Scotch broom seed pods on Nantucket, I see the seeds are being eaten uh, or the pods are being eaten by tiny beetles. Has your research examined whether there are local insect predators keeping the scotch broom from spreading rapidly? I think that's a great question. I think a lot of times um, when there's invasive species that um, kind of go crazy or proliferate in an area, it's because they don't have those um, you know, herbivores or predators to keep it in check. Um, I haven't done any research yet on, you know, looking at the potential um, predators for scotch brew myself. Um, I have just started this um, process of looking at scotch broom and first, first was like, where is it on the island? And then I hope to build some of these smaller um, projects moving forward. Um, I think we can learn so much from what's from our Western states where it's been such a problem for so long. There's actually a really extensive body of research um, obviously, we have different insects and um, different uh, potential predators. I think it would be really interesting to see um, if there are seed predators. And I think starting, if we do um, some germination trials, that would really inform some of that information. You know, we, at the very least, if we don't know what the insect predator is, looking at the seeds, um, counting seeds per pod and starting to try to germinate them, we'll be able to see if any were um, uh, preyed upon or eaten. Um, just so you know, too, if you, if anyone's ever, you know, if you're a gardener and you look at seeds, the seeds are always multicolored. So sometimes people can look at seeds and say if they're viable or not, you know, by what they look like, if they're fat or not, they have really variable seeds anyway. Just another tidbit. <laughs> um, I'm curious about the name. If it's native to Central Europe, why is it called Scotch Broom? That's a good, that's a good question. I don't know. It's funny because then there's like French broom and Portuguese broom and they hybridize. And I've always thought, wondered why, you know, what, what it is about the names. So honestly, I don't hold a lot of stock in common names um, because common names <laughs> of any plant um, are regionally specific oftentimes. Um, so one great example locally is our tupelo trees. So we love our tupelo trees. They're Nyssa sylvatica, you know, squam, you know, gorgeous trees. If you go to Martha's Vineyard, they do not call them tupelo trees. They are bung trees. So bung trees and tupelo trees are the same thing, but people can get confused. They're also called black gum. Yeah. So it's just like common names can be very tricky sometimes. Almost more like a nickname than anything. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's see. Um, all right. To what extent is cultural significance considered when evaluating a species for invasive status? Scotch broom is a beloved part of many people's memories of living on Nantucket, especially in the 20th century. I think that's a really good point. And especially, you know, I haven't 
ha been part of conversations where the cultural significance has come up for more recent species. Um, any cultural significance um, would be a, that I've you know seen from invasive research has been um, more in the uh, like the Native American cultural heritage for species. And a lot of that was with uh, my time on the West Coast as well. Um, I think that people have an identity uh, with certain species, especially on Nantucket. I mean, people love hydrangeas and daffodils. None of those are, are native either. Rosa rugosa is another one that is very invasive and changes the landscape dramatically, but people really like it. So I don't think it's a problem when people really enjoy a plant if you keep it um, in your landscape um, and care for it and keep it in check and maintain it. Um, I think most of the species that people associate like with Nantucket are not native. So privet, hydrangea, daffodils, rosaragosa, maybe scotch broom. Um, and we have so many wonderful native plants that provide so many valuable ecosystem services to our native flora and fauna. So, um, you know, uh, the Amelanchia nantucketensis, which is our Nantucket shad bush, also flowers very early. It's not nearly as showy as scotch broom, it's white flowers, um, but it blooms at a time when there's not really much else blooming. So it provides, you know, there's a different suite of pollinators available to it. Um, and the berries it provides are um, great for birds. And I think, you know, we could run down a whole list of native species that have cultural significance, have human uses and med medicines and all kinds of amazing things, but then also are part of the ecosystem and evolve with our ecosystem so that there's, you know, like I said, there's birds, there's so many insects, there's lots of other things that, you know, that's part of being part of the ecosystem, they're dependent on each other. And so I would hesitate to overvalue um, a species that people like when it might not be providing those services and in fact taking some of those services away by impacting the native species. Okay, um, well now is the time if anybody has any last questions to put them in the chat or the Q&A because we're kind of out of questions. Is there anything uh, you wanted to add that you haven't yet? No, I'm, I'm thankful for everybody that did ask questions. Um, my email is on here. So if you do think of something later, um, or want to, you know, want to talk through any of these issues, I've worked on invasive species for my whole academic career. Um, and so I'm, you know, happy to talk through some of this. It's really interesting, especially in light of climate change now, um, that we are seeing species move and even native species that might be trying to find new um, suitable climate envelopes, they might be having to move. And we think about it more easily with birds or animals that can physically move, but eventually our plant um, uh, you know, niches are gonna be moving as well. And it's really interesting to think about are, are some of our species that we consider you know, that are native or maybe rarities or something that might need to move, would they be considered invasive in other areas? So it's, um, uh, it's a really very interesting kind of subject right now. And there's, you know, it would be a cool kind of conversation piece um, to think about. Uh, so I'm happy to and have any of those conversations too. That sounds like an interesting topic is moving of the plant world. Um, Yep. <laughs> there's a whole, yeah, and there's a whole body of knowledge or a bo body of work um, thinking through uh, assisted migration. So would we help our plants move? And is that, a, you know, there's, you know, there's the, the research perspective of how to do it, then there's the um, ethical concerns and thoughts. And so it's, it's a kind of a really interesting um, subject. Yeah. Um, we do have one last question pop up. It seems like an excellent one to end on. Are there any positive benefits from Scotch broom? Ooh, I think, you know, there's, there's the positive benefit of the aesthetics. I mean, so many people really love Scotch broom. 
Um, and it is, um, you know, moderately evergreen. So it's, you know, kind of pleasing in the off, in the off season. I think some of the attributes that make it invasive are things that were, you know, depending on your value judgment, whether or not you think it's a positive, but you know, it is fast growing, it stabilizes soil. So if you're a gardener and you're planting it at home, it might be just the right plant for just the right spot. But I think it's the, um, the escape into the, the minimally managed, you know, conservation and, and open space lands that where we're maybe more concerned. Great. But I think I'm glad you made me end on a positive. It is, <laughs> I, it is gorgeous. I do. <laughs> it's, that's a positive. <laughs> there is a pink version as well. Is that also scotch burn? Um, yeah, I have to, I would have to look at what the horticultural name is because um, there are some, you know, different variations of the flowers within Scotch broom, but then there's like the French broom and the and the Portuguese broom, and I can't remember, like which what the what the color variations are of those. And then if they're hybridized, you know, mm. I am a I am a plant ecologist, but I am not a great horticulturalist. <laughs> <laughs> I have to confess. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sarah, so much for giving up your Wednesday night for us. Thank you so much, Amy and Janet and Daniel for um, making this possible. And thanks to everyone who came tonight. Yeah, I have Scotch broom in my yard. I'm going to go put it in the um, database. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that'll do it. All right. Thanks again.